Hi, I'm Dr. Sridhar Ganpati, a practicing pediatrician from Mumbai. Welcome to the STEER channel, an educational initiative by my teacher, Dr. Y.K. Ambedkar. The topic for the day, clinical assessment of cardiac function. We need to get into the history, historical details, and then follow it up with inspection, palpation, auscultation. So in the historical details, it is very essential to know what the mother had, what the mother had in the sense, her comorbid condition, diabetes mellitus, SLE. So when you have diabetes mellitus, the child could have cardiomyopathy, a transposition of great arteries, coarctation of biota, VSD, a pulmonary hypertension, what is known as the persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn. If you have an SLE in the mother, you could have a complete heart block in the baby. And then what diseases she had in pregnancy in the antenatal period. Very early in the antenatal period, most of these infections are teratogenic. So if you had herpes virus, cytomegalovirus, or even a toxoplasma infection, they could cause teratogenic effect and affect the heart early in pregnancy. And later on, they could cause myocarditis. You also know that if she had an illness like rubella, wherein you get a maculopapular rash with tender cervical lymphadenopathy, she could have the rubella syndrome, which can affect the heart. We also look at the drug exposure in the mother because anticonvulsants, antihypertensives, anti acne drugs sometimes go on and it's a bit late when you stop them. So, anticonvulsants like valproic acid and phenytoin anti-hypertensives like ACE inhibitors, ARV, then you have these two drugs can definitely cause defects in the heart. You have warfarin which can cause a warfarin baby. You have alcohol and smoking in the mother which can affect the baby. You have lithium which causes Epstein's anomaly. You have retinoic acid for acne which can cause coarctation of iota. And the list is long. Also, you need to know whether the mother had a congenital heart because if the mother had a congenital heart, the chances of her baby having a congenital heart is very high. Cytoplasmic inheritance. Much more than the general population. Then heritable influences. You need to look at sudden death, deafness, prolonged QT interval, halt or ram, septal defects, ASD, VSD the leopard syndrome. So these are all heritable, including Marfanoid features and aortic and mitral valve disease. What are the clinical clues that will point towards a cardiac involvement? You pick up a murmur. There is feeding intolerance in form of succress suck cycle, repeated respiratory infection, exercise intolerance. Cyanosis, cyanotic spells, scotting episodes, palpitation, perspiration on the forehead, precordial pain, syncopal attack, joint involvement preceded by a scarlet fever like picture, CNS involvement in the form of stroke, brain abscess, in arrhythmias, in cyanotic heart disease. So the, the amount of data that you can get from historical and clinical clues is phenomenal. And they contribute a big way in making a diagnosis. Clinical examination starts with inspection. And in inspection, we look at the child and see whether the child is dysmorphic, syndromic. So if there are all features of Downs, I know this child could have a VST, an endocardial cushion defect. If this child has elfin-like faces, I know this child could have a supravalvular aortic stenosis. An absent thumb, yes, an ASD or a VST. Is the child sick or not sick? The cyanotic hearts with a stroke, the eosyanotics with infective endocarditis, the large left to right shunt with repeated respiratory infections, they are the sick ones. Whereas a bicuspid aortic valve or a very small AST may look absolutely normal. 
Then we come to the skin. Do we have anything that points towards dyslipidemia, xanthelasma, towards insulin resistance, acanthosis nigricans, towards infective endocarditis, the hemorrhages under the nail bed, the Janeway's lesion, the petechial spots on the heart palate, all pointers towards an evidence of infective endocarditis. Then I would look at cyanosis, central peripheral. I would look at whether the skin looks bottled and pale, indicative of a failure of peripheral circulation. I would look at growth parameters, whether there are growth aberrations, both height and weight like in cyanotic art, weight especially in large left to right shunts with repeated respiratory infections. And I would also try to look at clubbing. For clubbing, there is a need for hypoxia to be going on for at least six months and thumb is the first digit that, that manifests clubbing. We also look at tachypnea. Tachypnea with tachycardia straight away tells you that this is a cardiac ailment. And autonomic excesses in the form of diaphoresis or perspiration. Then we look at the chest. Precordial bulge long-standing cardiac ailment. Pectus excavator, there could be a possibility of mitral valve prolapse with a straight back. Harrison's groove, a less compliant lung, a long-standing left to right shun, the pull on the diaphragm and the Harrison's groove on the lower part of the thorax. We also look for beading because today we know that severe vitamin D deficiency and thiamine deficiency can predispose to cardiac ailments. Then comes palpation. So the first thing under the heading of palpation is estimation of the pulse, rate, rhythm, volume, character. And you need to assess each and every arterial pulsation. So you assess both the carotids to assess the brachial, the radial, the dorsalis pedis, the posterior tibial, the popliteal, and the femur. When you are assessing the carotids, it should be one at a time. Don't assess both at the same time. You may compromise on CNS function. Equality is a must, especially when you have a stroke. Also, over-enthusiastic palpation of the carotid can cause a vagal overactivity. It's always better to feel the dorsalis pedis than the femoral because you make the child less irritable, easy access. So when you're thinking in terms of coarctation of iota, it is easier to feel the dorsalis pedis. So the volume, the rate, the rhythm, everything has to be the same on both sides. And if you find the lower, lower limb pulsations are not well felt in comparison to the upper limb and you have hypertension, you need to rule out co-optation of iota. Also in the pulse, you need to know whether they are regular, whether it is regularly irregular, irregularly irregular, so you tend to pick up arrhythmias. You also need to know that the quality of the pulse, a sudden upbeat and a sudden drop in runoff lesions, what are called as a collapsing pulse, iotic incompetence, PDA, you can have a hyperdynamic pulse in fever, thyrotoxicosis, anemia. You could have an alternating good volume and a poor volume pulse in a left ventricular dysfunction, what is known as pulses alternance. Or you can have an exaggerated fall in inspiration, what is called as pulses paradoxes, for which you require a sphygmo manometer to assess. So various types of pulses and you can make an, a rough assessment of what's going wrong. Then you come to pulsations or palpation, sorry, palpation of the precordium. 
And on the precordium, what we do is we look at the apex beat, apex impulse, tend to assess if there is cardiomegaly. Then we look at the point of maximum impulse to note whether it is RV dominance, which is close to the left sternal border and the xiphoid process and not towards the apex, which is a left ventricular dominance. And this point of maximum impulse, if it is diffuse and heave-like, it is probably volume overload. If it is tapping, it is pressure overload. And you also try to get thrills in the intercostal space. If you do get thrills in the intercostal space, these are collaterals in a case of co-optation of iota in an elder child, not in an young child. Next would be blood pressure estimation. So blood pressure estimation is done both in the lying down, in the sitting, as well as in the standing position. Usually we prefer the sitting with the arm rested, the right cuff, that is the length and width that covers the arm according to standards. And we also compare with the standards, the readings. Usually the lower limb BP is more than the upper limb BP. So if you find a disparity in this reading, you know that there could be a co-optation of iota. So upper limb BP being high, lower limb BP being on the lower side, do not co-optation of iota, that's one. Two, if you we do something called as the ankle brachial index, and when you take this ratio and you find it less than 0.9, and there is loss of hair, there are trophic ulcers, and you have skin changes, you would think in terms of peripheral vascular disease. We also do sitting and lying down BP and also standing and lying down BP. And if the fall in systolic BP is more than 20, diastolic more than 10, and there is a proportionate increase in the heart rate, you know this is postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension, signifies autonomic nervous system disorder and sometimes hypovolemia. Then we get into auscultation. For auscultation, you require the right stethoscope wherein the ear plugs fit in the ear canal properly without hurting in the same angle. The tubing is less than or equal to 12 inches because the longer the tube, the, there is a distortion in the sound, the quality of the sound goes down and it has a bell and a diaphragm. The bell is used for low frequency and the diaphragm for high frequency sound. So S1, S2 is the diaphragm. S3, S4 is the bell, for example. You need to auscultate the complete precordium, look for pericardial rub, pleural rub, pericardial rub not affected by the respiratory cycle, pleural rub affected by the respiratory cycle. You look for ronca, you look for crepitations, especially basal crepitation that goes in favor of a cardiac failure. You look at... Uh, uh, you also look at the various areas. So you find a murmur in the aortic area. It could be an aortic stenosis. Infraclavicular continuous murmur with bounding pulses. Could it be PDA? Repeated respiratory infections with a murmur in the uh, left sternal area. Could it be a VST? So you tend to correlate things with your findings with the other findings. All the findings need to be put together before you come to a provisional diagnosis. And in the end, let me give you some tips. Terms. You can have a silent chest in cyanotic heart, especially like in TGA or a pulmonary atresia with a closing PDA. When you have, don't forget to palpate the abdomen. A tender hepatomegaly will tell you that this is cardiac failure. You have a hepatojugular reflex trying to assess the right side of the heart. Never forget to look at the neck veins. They are prominent you know there is congestion as far as the right side of the heart and the lungs are concerned. We do look at JVP in different angles and you require a light source and two foot rulers for the same. I think Dr. Tushar has discussed this in our previous lectures. And if you find the liver in the middle, think of ersplenia, polysplenia syndrome. If you find it on the left side and also the heart on the other side, it could be uh, a dextrocardia with uh, situs inverses. So you need to correlate and put all the findings together to come to a provisional diagnosis. And clinical diagnosis goes a long way in keeping you comfortable.